Hello everyone. Thank you for joining today's Web Interface Support Webinar. This series of webinars is for Accountable Care Organizations, ACOs, and groups that are reporting data for the Quality Performance category of the Quality Payment Program through the CMS Web Interface for the 2018 performance period. These webinars will highlight important information and updates about reporting quality data and provide ACOs and groups with an opportunity to ask CMS subject matter experts their questions. During today's webinar, we will also share links to various resources and other information that will appear as announcements on your screen. Please note that these calls will only focus on reporting data for the quality performance category. We will not cover reporting data for the other performance categories during these calls. Please also note that today is the final webinar in the series for 2018 reporting. Now I will turn it over to Sandra Adams for, from the Center for Medicare at CMS. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, the 2018 CMS Web Interface um, webinar um, for today, um, the 20th of March. Next slide, please. This is our disclaimer slide. You can review this at your leisure. Next slide, please. This um, slide announces recent additions to the Quality Payment Program webinar library. We have added the recording, slides, and transcript for the webinar that took place on March 6th. And the slides are now available for the webinar that took place on March 13th. Next slide, please. So this slide provides a reminder that the um, CMS web interface will close on Friday, March 22nd at um, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, and this also shows you how to slide, um, sign into the webinar or to the CMS web interface. And um, you do not have to worry about clicking a submit button to submit your data at the end of the submission period. Next slide, please. And now Angela Stevenson will go over some um, frequent measure questions. Thanks, Sandra. Hi, this is Angie Stevenson with the PIMS Measures team. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? We wanted to uh, review a frequently asked question for the DM2 measure, and we did have this question at last week's support call, and we wanted to uh, clarify the answer that we gave. Um, So the question was, I'm sorry, um, for the DM2 diabetes hemoglobin A1C measure, if you are unsure as to the date of the A1C value, can you use the default date of December 31st, 2018? Um, we did research this in the measure specifications, and the answer is no. Medical record documentation should confirm and support that the A1C value is from the 2018 performance year. Per the numerator statement, the HbA1c is to be the most recent performed during the measurement period. At a minimum, documentation in the medical record must include a note indicating the date on which the test was performed and the result. If the day of the month is unknown, then you may enter um, 01, um, example, if you have documentation the test was done in May of 2018, then you can enter the first day of that month. Um, you are required to report the date of the HbA1c, and in the measure specifications on page 10, under numerator guidance, you can find this list of um, the priority ranking of the documentation uh, that you should use to, to verify the date of the test. That would be the lab report draw date, the lab report date, the flow sheet documentation, practitioner notes, or other documentation. 
And I will turn it back over to Sandra Adams. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. And now we will review some resources and where to go for help. Next slide, please. So um, this um, shows you the resources that are available on the Quality Payment Program Resource Library webpage. Next slide, please. So some additional um, resources that are available on the Quality Payment Program Resource Library. These include instructional videos. And um, also um, the Quality Payment Program Help and Support website um, that provides um, materials um, of, of, that are available for you and um, learning systems and developer tools. Next slide, please. And here is a list of the webinars available and slides um, and, and transcripts for the Quality Payment Program webinar library. Next slide, please. And here is um, the um, resources available for Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs and for Next Generation ACO Model. Next slide, please. Here is where you can get additional help from CMS. Next slide, please. And before we begin the um, question and answer session, um, I would just like to share that based on comments from the last two webinars, we want to reiterate that although the rate for Population 2 was not previously calculated in the CMS web interface, the data elements used to calculate it were captured. Previously submitted data on Population 3 contain data elements that capture beneficiaries identified as tobacco users through screening, as well as which of those beneficiaries received cessation counseling. These data elements were used to establish rates for Population 2, and those rates were used to create a benchmark for 2018. Initial analysis conducted on data entered into the CMS Web Interface for 2018 Web Interface Reporting thus far indicates that the established benchmarks for ACO 17 or PrEP 10 are acceptable and the change in timing for tobacco intervention guidance does not impact the usability of the established benchmarks. We hear your concerns and will continue to monitor the data received through the CMS web interface. Once the submission period closes, we will further assess the data. And now um, Michaela will, um, will go over the question and answer period. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so yeah, we will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. You can ask questions via chat or via phone. To ask a question via phone, please dial 1-866-452-7887. And if prompted, provide the conference ID number, which is 458-4007. And be sure to press star 1 to be added to the question queue. And if you have a follow-up question or a clarification that you want to share in the chat um, during this portion of the webinar, uh, please type follow-up question at the beginning of your chat question, and that way you can flag that for us. Um, so first, I'll read off a few chat questions. Um, we have one on PREV8, and this person says that they have documentation from 2014 that states that immunizations are up to date. Will this meet the intent of the measure? 
So this is Deb from the PIMS team, um, and this answer was also provided in the resolution of a help desk ticket. Um, and the answer is yes, if in 2014 you have documentation of the pneumococcal vaccine is up to date, this would meet the intent of the measure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question says, if there is no CCLF data on a beneficiary for PY 2018, how are they sampled if an eligible encounter is required? Sure, this is Olivia Burzen, um, and this um, inquirer is asking about claiming claim line feeds that are delivered to ACOs, so this answer is um, just for ACOs, but um, beneficiaries who have opted out of data sharing are not included on the claim and claim line feeds, and it is in addition, certain claim types, such as substance abuse claims, are suppressed from the data. Um, so those are just a few of the reasons that a beneficiary could be sampled, but not um, included on one of your claim and claim line feeds. Thank you. This next question says, there are MIPS points displayed on the QPP website once we have submitted our final GPRO. Does this MIPS scoring represent only if one was an individual provider submitting, or does it also pertain to the MIPS score for an MSSP Track 1 ACO? Hi, this is Lisa Murray. So if you're looking at the web interface and if you're part of an ACO, the scores that you see and the amount of data that's been reported all pertains to the ACO. If you're an individual TIN or individual group that has reported via the web interface, then you will see your group score relative to the data that has been submitted. So, so again, ACO will only see ACO information and groups will only see um, information relative to the groups. Great, thank you. And Stephanie, do we have any phone questions at this time? There are no questions at this time. If you would like to ask a question, please press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that's star then the number one on your telephone keypad to ask your question. All right, so our next question is on PREV-12 depression screening. Can you use a screening done during an inpatient encounter is their first question. And then they're also saying if the name of the screening is not in the documentation, but the two questions from PHQ2 are documented and the answers are documented, would this meet the intent of the measure? Hi, this is Jessica from the PIMS measures team. And to answer the first question regarding whether you can count a screening done during an inpatient encounter, <clears throat> excuse me, you're welcome to count any depression screening that is that is a standardized, normalized screening that has been uh, documented and signed off by the eligible an eligible clinician. Um, and there are no specifics as to when it took place. Um, the denominator codes that are provided in the coding document are for convenience, so that you can locate uh, an encounter that may be um, applicable for abstraction. And to answer your second question uh, about whether the name of the screening assessment needs to be documented, um, or if it's not documented, what will be accepted? Um, and you're correct, the name should be documented, um, but we understand that there are medical record EMRs that are set up to just contain the questions built into the tool. And in those instances, CMS, in the event of an audit, CMS would accept that as long as the questions are exactly how they appear in the original assessment. And in addition, um, it's recommended that you provide a policy and have a policy in place throughout the performance year to, to indicate that these questions are the PHQ2, PHQ9 screening tools that were incorporated into your EMR. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is on MH1. In order for a patient to be eligible for this measure, does the patient have to meet all three of the criteria? Um, a visit during the index period, the appropriate diagnosis, and a PHQ-9 performed? This is Jessica from the PIMS measures team again. Uh, correct, um, in order for that 
patient to be denominator eligible, uh, they must have an active diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia um, at the time when the PHQ-9, the initial PHQ-9 was performed, and that's just to emphasize that the patient is appropriate for the measure. Thank you. Thank you. This next question asks, can you explain the QMV audit process and the expected timelines? This is Olivia. Fiona, I don't know if you want to give a high-level overview um, or if um, perhaps this individual could submit their question to the Shared Savings Program mailbox. Um, yeah, I think that would be the best thing if they could actually submit it to the Shared Savings Program mailbox. Um, then that way we can address that question. All right, so our next question asks, to please clarify, for 2018, which of the 31 ACO quality measures will factor into the ACO participants' MIPS score in the quality, quality category? Um, and they say that the MIPS score calculated in the QVP portal would indicate that only the web interface measures, the 15 clinical measures, are creating the MIPS quality score. Um, but then they note that the 2019 SSP and MIPS interaction guide document would indicate that the web interface measures and the CAPS measures create the score. So are the ACO's claims-based measures included? So this is Fiona from the Shared Savings Program. The ACO claims-based measures are not included um, in the quality score for MIPS. Um, and eligible, eligible clinicians in an ACO get a quality performance score based on the CMS web, in, web interface and CAPS or ACO quality measures that are reported by the ACO. And that's actually in the 2018 um, um, SSP and MIPS um, interactions guide, which is uh, posted on our website. Great, thank you. And uh, Stephanie, do we have any phone questions at this time? There are no questions at this time. All right, thank you. Um, so this next question says, if we submit consecutively 300 patients for a measure, would we be audited on patient 305 and have to submit data if we did not submit data on the patient initially? This is Olivia. Um, I can attempt to answer this. Um, no, if, if that patient number 305 is not consecutively completed and is thus not kind of part of the measure calculation, if you will, um, then no, I, I don't believe they would be audited. Great, thank you. And our next question is a follow-up uh, on PREV8. Uh, they say this documentation from 2014 does not specify um, that the pneumonia vaccine is up to date. It just states that vaccines more broadly are up to date. Would that meet the intent of the measure? This is Dan Green. I would suggest no. Thank you. Um, this next question, this person says, my web interface reporting shows that we have met the minimum for all measures, um, 14 out of 14. Do I have to do anything else to ensure that my reporting is completed? Hi, this is Aslam. Uh, if you have met the minimum requirement for all 14 measures, um, all your data submitted um, are saved and you are 100% um, completed reporting. You do not need to take any further action. Thank you. Thank you. And this next question, uh, this person says, in the web interface under the view reports data confirmation section, they say that the download report button only allows me to print. Why is there no option to save the file? Um, 
Hi, this is Azam again. If uh, when you click on the download uh, button, your uh, print uh, print native print window comes up. Uh, you can either at that step you can either print it out or uh, save the document as a PDF. So um, once you click print uh, or once you click download, the print window pops up. Uh, which will have an option to save the document as a PDF. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephanie, do we have any phone questions at this time? There are no questions at this time. To ask your question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. All right. So our next question asks, is ESRD considered limited life expectancy for PREV-10? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Um, ESRD alone would not be an exception. There would need to be other medical record documentation to support that the patient had a limited life expectancy. Thank you. All right, and our next question is on MH1. If the patient chart only has depression or depressive disorder documented in the notes without an ICD-10 code, does this meet the requirement for the diagnosis to be confirmed? Hi, this is Jessica from the PIMS measures team. And, and the measure owner, Minnesota Community Measurement, is very specific about what's accepted in the denominator for this measure, as the intent is that only those patients who have major depression or dysthymia get pulled in. So if you have depression um, handwritten like, like in a paper chart, um, or it's on the problem list or progress note. Um, it would be great if you could confirm the appropriate inclusion uh, by, by checking the codes uh, to see if it maps to a code. Um, with that encounter, one of the denominator eligible codes are listed in the coding document. Um, otherwise, if, if you're unclear whether the patient has major depression, um, then you can access the billing system for codes. The only problem with that is, is that that information has to be available in the event of an audit. If that case gets audited and you do not have the documentation available to indicate that that patient was actually you know, um, diagnosed with major depression or, or dysthymia, then, um, then you might not pass for that patient. So you just really need to have that documentation indicating what, what their diagnosis is and that it would be appropriate for that measure. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question uh, says, uh, for the MIPS scores for the ACO displayed on the QPP website, um, is that truly the MIPS score for the ACO? And they're asking, there is no difference in how an ACO might be scored. ACOs. In the web interface for ACOs, the performance rate is displayed. And then for groups, um, the score for each measure is displayed. Um, so that's what you see when you're in the web interface. So we're not exactly sure if what the person is really trying to um, capture with, with their questions that we're, hope we're answering in terms of what you're seeing in the web interface when you're an ACO or a group. All right, thank you. Our next question is on PREV-12, um, and they say that someone mentioned that the depression screening does not need to take place on the same day as an outpatient encounter. Um, but they note that the measure spec states that it uh, needs to take place during an eligible encounter. Um, can you please provide some clarification? Hi, this is Jessica from the PIMS team. Thank you so much for calling that out. I, I stopped my answer short, but you are correct. So for PREV-12, the screening uh, can take place prior to the, the outpatient encounter. Um, it, it's allowable as a telehealth measure. It, it can be... Um, you know, submit through a kiosk uh, when the patient checks in. The, the eligible clinician, though, needs to review the results and sign off on them during the, the 
um, outpatient encounter. And then if it is positive for depression at that same encounter, then there has to be that follow-up plan documented at that same encounter. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephanie, I think if we have someone on the phone, we can take a question there. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. All right, so we will read some more chat questions. Our next one is on PrEP 10. What is the population that will be included in our performance, and how do the other populations contribute to our score? Hi, this is Angie from the PIMS team. I can confirm that uh, population two will be used to score the measure, um, but um, maybe another team could speak to the how the other populations contribute. I don't believe that they do, that they're not, that I don't believe they are included in the score. Hi, this is Sandra. Um, it is population two that is used to calculate the measure. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question is on CARE 1. If the patient is discharged to rehab, do we confirm the discharge or check uh, not unable to verify discharge? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So for the actual discharge, if you're able to verify that discharge date, you would want to go ahead and confirm that. Um, in the next question, asking if the patient was seen within 30 days of that discharge, um, that visit must be an outpatient visit. So if that portion was not completed or if they didn't have an outpatient visit, that's where you would answer no to that question. And then um, that discharge will be removed from the calculations of the measure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is on uh, PREV10. Is there a benchmark available to view for only the population two in the measure? This is Olivia. Yes, those benchmarks are available um, online, and we can send out a link to, um, to that document to everyone on this webinar. Great. Thank you. Um, and our next question is asking to please repeat uh, what was stated regarding the tobacco cessation and intervention measure. Hi. Um, this is Sandra. I'm assuming that the um, question is related to the information that we shared at the beginning of the webinar about how the, um, how the um, benchmark was calculated. So um, we, with previously submitted data, um, it contained the data elements that were needed to calculate the benchmark and um, to establish rates for population two. And those rates were used to um, create a benchmark for 2018. Thank you. And Stephanie, just wanted to check to see if we have anyone on the phone. There are no questions at this time. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question, this person wants to confirm that for the depression remission, they can use a PHQ-2. This is Jessica from the PIMS measures team. And for MH1, depression remission at 12 months, only a, a completed, a full PHQ-9 will count for this measure. As stated on page 12 of the denominator confirmation, all nine questions must be answered to have a valid summary score. Um, so, so unfortunately, if you just have documentation of a PHQ-2, then you would select no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this next question says, regarding bonus points for MSSP participants uh, doing end-to-end -end reporting, are the bonus points applied as 1% to each measure, one point per domain, or one point towards our MIP score for quality?
Um, Michaela, can what what number um, is that question, or can you repeat the question? Yeah, it's number 31 regarding bonus points for MSSP participants uh, doing end-to-end -end reporting. Are the bonus points applied as 1% to each measure, one point per domain, or one point towards their MIPS score for quality? Um, Michaela, we'll get back to that question. Let's just go to a different one. We'll go to that one in a few minutes. Okay. Let's see. So our next question is on, uh, okay, it says, what if the patient receives cessation counseling at DC from the hospital if it is after the most recent tobacco screening? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Um, cessation counseling done at discharge from a hospital would be acceptable if it was provided after the most recent screening where the patient was identified as a tobacco user. Thank you. Thank you. And our next one, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I think we answered this one, so let me go pull a different one. All right, for colon cancer screening, if a patient turns 76 during the reporting year and they are due for colon cancer screening after this date, are they numerator compliant or not confirmed for the measure? This is Deb from the PIMS team, and I'm trying to look up um, this measure. I the, the, Age range for this measure is between the ages of 50 and 75. So if you have a patient that's turned 76 within the submission period or within the performance year, I believe they are would not be um, attributed to Prov 6, but I'd like confirmation from um, the assignment and sampling team if possible. Again, the age range stops at 75 for Prov 6. Hi, this is Sarah from um, the sampling team at RTI. Right, so we would sample for a beneficiary at the end of the performance year. They need to be within the expected age range. So that's correct. Okay, so my recommendation for this particular caller, I would look at the date of birth because if you're seeing a patient that's 76 years old, within the PREV-6 measure, it could be that the date of birth is incorrect, and if you were to update that date of birth, that patient would be replaced with a patient that meets the um, age criteria of the measure. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephanie, do we have anyone on the line? There are no questions at this time. Alrighty, so our next one is for PREV-10, are you looking for cessation counseling at the last uh, primary care provider visit only, or do specialist visits count as well? Hi, this is Angie from PIMS. Um, specialist visit, it wouldn't, it doesn't matter if it's a primary care or a special, specialist visit, it should be done after the most recent screening where the patient's tobacco use status was documented. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, our next question on CARE 1, if a specialist uh, reconciled discharge meds but um, only applicable meds to his or her specialty, not all meds from discharge, would this specialist meet the intent of the measure and be numerator compliant? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So no, that would not be considered a numer numerator compliant. Um, the medication reconciliation must reconcile the most recent list in the outpatient medical record with the discharge medication. So a partial reconciliation would not count for the measure. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, 
we are scrolling through the questions here, and let me find another one. And Stephanie, we don't have anyone on the phone, do we? No questions at this time. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, for press ten, will our report only, or will it include the rate two for 2017, since we have not received that rate in last year's quality reporting? If this is from an ACO. Um, our plan um, is to provide um, last year's rate for every measure as well as um, this year's rate for every measure in your annual quality performance report. Um, so stay tuned for more information. All right, thank you. And our next question on CARE 1, if a patient was readmitted prior to their 30-day discharge follow-up, and then the follow-up to the readmission was outside of 30 days of the original discharge. How do we answer the office visit follow-up question? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So you're reporting just based on that pre-populated discharge date. So if the follow-up did not occur within the specified time range for that discharge, you would select no, the patient did not have a visit within 30 days. So if the patient perhaps was, or excuse me, had another um, discharge with a separate pre-populated date and that follow-up was completed in the appropriate time frame, then you could select yes. But just based on that first instance, um, there was not an office visit within the 30 days. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next question says, in the document titled Quality Measure Benchmarks for the 2018 and 2019 Reporting Years, um, they're referencing Table 3, uh, saying that it notes that the CARE 1 MedRec is pay for performance, um, but previously you stated that CARE 1, MH, and PREP 13 were all pay for reporting. Can you please clarify which is correct? This is Kristen from RTI. So in that document, there's actually an asterisk um, next to that measure. And that directs you to a, a note at the bottom of the page that states that that measure will pay, phase into the pay for performance and performance year 2019. So for this year in, in 2018, it's still a pay for reporting measure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, for our next question, uh, did the link for the PREV 10 benchmarks get sent out yet? I think that's a question for you, Michaela. I um, have the link um, in the chat box. All right, and we can actually, we can send that out right now if it hasn't gone out yet, Deirdre. Um, Olivia sent it. And Stephanie, do we have anyone on the phone? There are no questions at this time. Okay. All right, so our next question, I see a follow-up uh, for MH1. If the patient had a PHQ-9 less than or equal to 5 or did not have a PHQ-9 performed during the index period, would we respond with a 22? This is Jessica from the PIMS measures team. Um, I'm not sure what 22 is. I'm assuming that might be the coding behind uh, maybe the yes or no data points. Um, if someone does know, please feel free to jump in. But from a measure spec, um, uh, so if you have a patient with a PHQ-9 less than or equal to 5, and I assume you're referring to the numerator action, since it's less than five, that would be to show remission. If it's less than five, then you would select yes, because that indicates the patient was in remission. However, if you're talking about a PHQ-9 
during the denominator confirmation, if it's not greater than nine, um, then then you would need to select um, no, because then that patient would not meet one of the requirements to pass denominator confirmation. Uh, regarding your second part of the question, if they did not have a PHQ-9 performed during the index period, that would be for denominator confirmation. You would select no, and that patient would be skipped. If I did not understand that question, please feel free to raise your hand to um, talk with us um, on the phone, or please resubmit the question. Otherwise, um, we have all eyes on, on the the queues, so if you want to submit a question to Quality Payment Program um, through our website, then you're absolutely welcome to, and, and we'll get that answered as soon as possible. Thank you. And this is, Deb, I just want to also clarify if you are talking about the numerator compliance, that would be a not met because it has to be less than five. And Deb, I'm sorry, you were breaking up a little bit. Could you please repeat that? All right, if I'm still breaking up, I will send it to one of my teammates so they can read it. But I just wanted to clarify that if your score for the numerator compliance in MH1 is equal to 5, that is not numerator compliant. Um, that would be a numerator fail. Your PHQ-9 has to be less than 5 within the numerator portion of that measure. Thank you, Deb. And it looks like this person had a quick follow-up question there. Um, or they're saying that 22 is the additional denominator criteria if the PHQ-9 score is less than or equal to 9, or the PHQ-9 administered is no. So I think in this case, this, this particular um, caller is asking about the denominator confirmation. So within the denominator, if you have a PHQ-9 less than 5, then the patient would not be considered denominator eligible. And if you follow the guidance provided in the posted MH1 specification, um, both the guidance and the flow will show you how to, um, basically what you're going to do is skip that patient by saying that there is not a PHQ-9 greater than 9, which would have indicated denominator confirmation. And this is Jessica as well from PIMS. Uh, just to clarify, for denominator confirmation, they need to have a score uh, greater than 9. Um, the caller indicated less than or equal to 9. So in order to be considered denominator eligible, they have to have an active diagnosis of major depression or dysthymia alongside with a PHQ-9 that has a score greater than 9 during that denominator identification period. And if you would like to talk about this more, please, please call the Quality Payment Program and we'll reach out to you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our next question is on PREV10. Are we able to see what the benchmark is for our group? So in the link that um, was just um, displayed to folks, um, we should be able to see the ACO17 or otherwise known as PREV10 benchmarks um, for 2018. And the, these particular benchmarks for PREV10 apply to, and all web interface measures actually, apply to both group practices reporting through the web interface and ACOs. Thank you. And Stephanie, is anyone on the line? There are no questions at this time. Michaela, this is Sandra. Could we go back to the end-to-end, -end, um, the question about end-to-end -end bonus points? Yeah. So end-to-end -end bonus points are not part of the shared savings program quality score. Um, but in regards to the way MIPS um, is applying bonus points, so there is, um, there is a cap on the number of bonus points that are available for electronic end-to-end -end reporting at 10% of the denominator 
of the quality performance category percent score. So that's um, how that's applied under MIPS. All right, thank you. Um, our next question, um, or actually, Stephanie, is anyone on the phone line? There are no questions at this time. All right, and reminder too, if you uh, do want to dial in to ask a question via phone, uh, please follow the instructions on the screen and um, be sure to press star one uh, to be added to the queue. Um, so our next question, is there an email that gets sent if all submissions are done? Um, how will we know when it's been completed? Is there a way to confirm that? This is Sandra. For Shared Savings Program, we do send an email, um, a confirmation email, when um, the quality reporting window has closed. And for groups, um, groups will also receive um, an email just indicating that the web interface is closed and that whatever data was submitted is the data that will be utilized for scoring purposes. Great, thank you. And it looks like we are um, getting some people asking us to please repeat that response on the end-to-end -end reporting question. So this is Sandra. The end-to-end -end points are not used in the shared savings program quality score. But in regard to um, the MIPS score, um, bonus points are applied. So there is a cap on the electronic end-to-end -end reporting at 10% of the denominator of the quality performance category percent score. That's how that works under MIPS. Great, and then I see uh, someone's also asking if you can repeat the part about the cap on the bonus points for ACOs reporting via web interface. So there is so there is a cap on the number of bonus points available for electronic end-to-end -end reporting at 10% of the denominator of the quality performance category percent score. Thank you. Um, and we have another question. It says, if the measure rates report does not provide a measure score, since there isn't a benchmark, how will the measures be scored? Will 2018 data be used to establish the benchmarks for the scoring? We have. So in regard to the first portion of the question, asking about how scoring is done for a measure without a benchmark, so at least in regard to groups participating in MIPS. So for groups, all, all groups are required to report on all web interface measures, even measures that do not have a benchmark. In the event that there is a measure that doesn't have a benchmark, um, that particular measure will not be calculated into the overarching score if all reporting was completed for that measure. If a measure without a benchmark was not completed in reporting, then that measure will be calculated into the score for, for that measure, meaning that if you didn't report anything, you'll, that will be calculated into the score. Sandra, do you want to add anything for ACOs? Yes, um, on the Shared Savings Program um, webpage, um, you will find a benchmarking document, and that um, provides the benchmarks for the um, for the web interface measures, the um, the um, claims based measures, and the caps for ACO measures, and a. Um, and if a measure does not have a benchmark, it is paid for reporting. Great, 
Thank you. Um, our next question is asking uh, for a clarification on MRNF. Um, can we use MRNF if there is an absence of any records in 2017 and 2018, but there is historical data in the MR from 2016 or earlier? This is Olivia, um, and I just encourage you to um, look in the um, Q&A document that's been posted on the Quality Payment Program Resource Library to um, learn more about when is an appropriate time to use medical record not found. It sounds like in this case the medical record is found, um, so it would not be probably appropriate to use it then, but I'd encourage you to take a look at the Q&A document. Thank you. This next question asks, what is end-to-end -end reporting? Um, can you clarify that? Hi, this is Aslam. Uh, measure data electronically uploaded into the CMS web interface via API or Excel file upload are eligible for end-to-end -end electronic reporting bonus. You can earn one bonus point per each web interface measure uh, that's capped at 10% of your denominator. In order to earn end-to-end -end bonus points, you need to update or complete at least one or more beneficiaries in a measure via web interface API or Excel file upload. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question asks, if an ACO reports on all eligible beneficiaries in a P4R measure, but the performance is less than 30%, do they still get points in MIPS quality and in MSSP quality? Michaela, could you please repeat the question? Yes. So if an ACO reports on all eligible beneficiaries in a P4R measure, but their performance is less than 30%, do they still get points in MIPS quality and in MSSP quality? This is Olivia. I can take that from the MSSP quality perspective. Um, if a measure is paid for reporting, you will receive full points on the measure for completely reporting the, um, the CMS web interface measures. Um, your performance is not compared to benchmarks for those pay for reporting measures. Lisa Marie? Dan, are you still on the line? Should we be able to answer that? Okay, I guess Dan's not on the line, but if there's not a benchmark for a measure and you complete reporting, then you're not scored on that particular measure. But again, if you do not complete reporting, for a measure without a benchmark, and that will be calculated into your your score for quality. All right, and I am seeing a few uh, more questions on end-to-end -end bonuses. Um, so to clarify, those uh, when you're saying that those aren't available to MSSP participants, you're talking about the measure performance rate, correct? and that end-to-end -end bonus points do apply for the MIPS quality score for MSSP participants? Hi, this is Sandra. If I understand the question, the end-to-end -end bonus points are not used to calculate the shared savings program quality score, but they are used to calculate the MIPS quality score. All right, thank you, Sandra. And that is all the time that we have for today. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
And if we weren't able to answer your question, uh, please feel free to email uh, these addresses for help with the Quality Payment Program, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, and Next Generation. Um, and we sent those emails out as an announcement that you should have seen pop up on your screen. And here they are again. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please hold the line.